Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Katie Rowley. I'm with the NOAA Central Library and I will be your webinar host today. If you are having any trouble uh, with the audio or seeing the slides, please try logging out and logging back in. That is usually the best way to fix that. If the problem is still persisting, you can either chat at me using the chat box or you can email library.brownbag at noaa.gov and I will try and troubleshoot that for you. We are accepting questions today, but those questions will be held until the end of each uh, presentation. We have two Canals Fellows who will be speaking each about uh, 20 to 25 minutes, holding a little bit of time for questions after each one. We are recording today, so if you miss any part of it or you have to head out halfway through, um, these will be recorded and placed on the library's YouTube channel. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne, Christine, and Kane, who is going to introduce our speakers. Great, thank you. Um, so first, I want to introduce Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin received her PhD from the Scripps Uni uh, Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego where her research focused on understanding how crustaceans respond to changing ocean conditions, including ocean acidification. Prior to starting her Knauss Fellowship in the OAR International Activities Office in February, she worked on the project she's presenting today with the Joint Institute of Marine and Atmospheric Research at the NIMS Pacific Island Fishery Science Center. And I'm handing it over to Caitlin now. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, today I'm really excited to present some of the work I did um, in six months working at the Joint Institute of Marine and Atmospheric Research at PIPS. Um, this is in the six months before I began my fellowship at the NOAA uh, OAR International Activities Office. So first I'd like to highlight some of the work of my collaborators. Uh, Mariska Weyerman, who's an ecosystem modeler at Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center, she developed a Guam ecosystem model and is now working on the uh, Hawaiian Atlantis ecosystem model. And then Tai Kandinger, who's a coral reef ecologist, um, and she's very familiar with the best practices for meta-analyses and systematic reviews. And so throughout the talk today, you'll see how both of their expertise really uh, aligned with this project. And they were wonderful supervisors and mentors. So my research background is in running studies like this one up on the screen. Um, we're all well acquainted with the warming and the changes in ocean chemistry that we're expecting uh, in our oceans now and into the future. And one of the ways we can understand what our ocean will look like in the future is by bringing marine life back to the lab and exposing them to these sorts of future ocean conditions. And so this uh, on the screen is one such example. Jerry and Tunin took three species of coral from two different sites on Oahu, Hawaii, and expose them to increased temperature, oceanification-like conditions, or both. So these figures here are for overall survival after three months in these treatments. And by that point, the corals that had seen both warming and acidification, like these guys right here, experienced some mortality, as high as 100% mortality for this possible forest species from Waimanalo Bay. But I like showing this study for a couple of reasons. They underline a few key points for my project. One of these is that in many of these experimental treatments, you can see a difference in responses between uh, the two different locations, these pink and blue bars. These uh, collection sites on Oahu are quite close to each other, as you can see on the map. Uh, but these locations have different levels of pH and temperature stress that influences the coral susceptibility, which you see in this experiment. And for these three species of coral, even though they coexist among each other on these reefs, they too have quite different responses from one another to the same local stressors. And so this is a perfect example of why examining not just one or two, but a whole suite of studies is really important to getting us a better understanding of responses to temperature and acidification. And one of the tools that gives us insight into entire regions and what they may look like in the future are Atlantis ecosystem models, which support ecosystem-based management. Atlantis is a three-dimensional, spatially structured, end-to-end -end marine ecosystem model. So it's based on these dynamically interacting modules, the physics, biology, fisheries, uh, monitoring and assessment, and economics. So it really is end-to-end -end from the oceanography all the way up to the societal uh, side of it. The model is comprised of polygons, of homogenous areas of benthic habitat or oceanographic conditions. And these Atlantis models have been developed all over the world, as you can see in this figure here. 
But going back to this first uh, part of the slide, by taking a closer look at what the drivers are for this model on the very left-hand side, you can see that it includes environmental variables such as temperature and pH. And so here is where there's an opportunity opportunity to inform Atlantis on how we expect life in the future oceans to, uh, to look like, but how we expect them to respond. So we can take the opportunity from all these experiments in the lab and in the field and use it to improve the way that Atlantis can support ecosystem-based management. And there have been a couple different ways that those who are working on Atlantis models have added in information about climate change sensitivity. Um, Olson et al. used eight Atlantis models. Those are those different colored bars you see on the screen, ranging from the California Current to the Barents and the Nordic Sea models to simulate oceanification. And so to do that, they applied a standard rate of mortality, uh, 0.5 or 1%, to account for pH sensitivity for organisms that are sensitive, such as mollusks. And that's roughly aligned with some of the results from earlier meta-analyses, but it is still a less nuanced approach applying that same value across these different groups. But what you can do see is here when it's applied to these groups like the primary producers and the infauna, there are also impacts that uh, rise up to the model to the, to the mammals. Bush and McElhaney really pushed forward prioritization in the, the California current ecosystem model by performing a systematic review, really digging into all that literature to develop a database of laboratory and field studies that expose temperate species to these changes in carbonate chemistry or oceanification-like conditions. And they calculated survival scalars, like what you see on the screen here, that's a combination of whether the organism had a positive or negative response to these changes in carbonate chemistry, took into account um, important details about the experiment, like how long it was conducted. But these scalars also uh, include the evidence and agreement in the literature uh, for each of these different functional groups here. So with these different approaches uh, in mind for how others have approached uh, parameterizing in the Atlantis ecosystem model, we used an approach to develop sensitivity parameters uh, using quantitative values to develop relationships uh, with temperature and pH and effect sizes that we gathered through a systematic review. So again, the goal is to inform that submodule of Atlantis the best information we have now about how the biology of interest uh, in Hawaii responds to these changing ocean conditions. So I start off by creating a comprehensive set of terms to capture all the relevant, relevant literature on pCO2 and pH and temperature experiments on marine organisms. So here on the screen, you see one of the example of the strings that I use to search in the web of science and gather that data. But there's also half a dozen more that included words of pH and temperature. And additionally, I pulled from the Oceanification International Coordination Center's bibliographic database as well to gather this literature. So we're interested in a key set of responses that included survival, growth, nutritional content, behavior, mineralization, reproduction, early life stages. You see that all in these search terms here. And those fall into general categories that Atlantis uh, can use in terms of responses. But some of those responses that we didn't include include metabolism and chlorophyll content, for example, that don't quite fit in those categories. We found uh, over 6,400 abstracts, which encompass the, the period of study from the 1970s all the way to last August. So obviously, with such broad search terms with the goal of capturing all the relevant studies in this pool, there's still quite a few papers that sneak in. Um, for example, one of the search terms for nutri nutritional quality returned an abstract for diet plans for U.S. Marine soldiers. Not relevant. So after downloading all the records for these papers, I used a tool called Abstracker. It's a web-based annotation tool that's free to use, and you can input keywords that suggest whether an abstract is relevant or flag words that are outside of your defined criteria. So that's sort of what this example on the screen. Ultimately, the user determines whether each study is a yes or a no or a maybe for evaluation later. What's especially useful about Abstracker is it uses active machine learning. So as the user categorizes studies, it analyzes the remaining abstracts and brings the ones that are most likely to be relevant to the service. So rather than reading all 6,400 abstracts, I reviewed 8,700, and I knew that I was done because those last 100 or so that it pushed forward didn't contain any relevant work. But to make sure I uh, captured the full set of relevant literature, I also checked the references of 15 key meta-analyses. So I've already mentioned that we only examine studies with a broad, but still not totally encompassing set of responses to these stressors. But we also narrowed our focus in um, a couple other ways that I'll mention. Uh, one of those is by focusing on certain groups of species. So although our focus was incredibly broad, it encompassed everything from phytoplankton and corals to a variety of fish, except those that are highly migratory. And in Atlantis, these are grouped together into functional groups. 
So sponges, but also barnacles and anemones fall together into filter feeders. And corals are grouped into one of four functional groups, like the parietes, the fossil like corals. So today, some of the results I'm going to share are in even larger categories, such as structural benthic species that include the crestus coralline algae and the corals, just for ease of viewing on figures. And these all have abbreviations. You're going to see them throughout my talk, but I'll explain the ones that are relevant so you don't have to keep those in mind. So while we included a broad number of functional groups, we did pare down the relevant literature geographically. Ideally, we'd like to only use species that are found in Hawaiian waters, but that's a really limited set of research. So we broadened our criteria to include organisms collected in the tropical Pacific and the Indo-Pacific using the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn's bounding lines. So while there may be a slightly more nuanced approach to this, um, when screening thousands of papers, setting really clearly defined criteria such as latitude is integral to keep that process moving along. You don't want your literature search to go out of date while you're still at the process of screening papers, essentially. Um, so once all that literature is screened, the final step is actually squeezing out the data, which can come from text, tables, or figures in the paper using something like Webplot Digitizer. Uh, I also collected a large set of metadata from all these papers. That ranges from crucial information like the treatment values for pH or temperature, or information about the collection location, the life stage of the organism, study duration, uh, a large number of uh, extra variables there. So all told, our database comprised 335 studies that examined the responses we were interested in with organisms from areas that we're interested in, uh, in response to experiments of temperature and pH or carbonate chemistry changes. So I'll be breaking up the rest of the talk into two sections. First, diving in a bit more into the database we compiled, and then discussing the calculation of sensitivity parameters that we can put into Atlantis. So on to the experiments that we collected. I wanted to share an overview of how our database breaks down across the 50 plus functional groups uh, that Atlantis can use. So on this figure, we have counts of the number of experiments reported for pH and temperature stressors. pH in the uh, blue color and temperature in the salmon color. I'll note this is not uh, specifically the number of studies or papers. Um, can e each paper can contain distinct sets of information, like different species that they study, different life stages, different collection locations of species, etc. that each provide their own bit of information. So that's reflected in these counts here. The primary producers, which include both fleshy and calcareous macroalgae, as well as two size classes of phyto recognized in the literature, which is quite important for the Atlantis ecosystem model, as these form the base of the trophic system. So the more data that inform the parameterization here, the better it is uh, going further up in the trophic web. Uh, you'll notice that turf algae are not well represented in this database, in part because in a lot of the studies in mesocosms where they are included, the turf algae itself hasn't really been teased apart from other signals from other organisms. The structural benthic species comprise Prestos coralline algae, or CCA, uh, Montipora, Postlopora, and a branching and massive form of Parides, as well as a deeper water coral species, which we didn't find any data for. But overall, there's quite a lot of data for these, uh, these groups. What I find interesting is that there's about the same number of pH experiments or even more than there are for temperature experiments, despite temperature being a variable of interest for a comparatively longer time. This, so this really underscores the burgeoning interest in ocean acidification research over the last decade or so, especially on uh, organisms such as corals. You'll notice there are quite a few functional groups here that don't have any data. Um, so one of these categories of fish, which include uh, seven functional groups, is largely devoid of any research. These are your trigger fish, um, your flounder, and some snapper. Um, they're also important components of the ecosystem, but they may be less easy to study in experimental uh, systems, for example. The reef fish, on the whole, have more studies, but you'll notice it's very unequally distributed. There is a plethora of work on these small planktivorous fishes, uh, but on, and some on the, the benthic piscivores, but none on surgeon fish or corallivores like butterfly fish. And digging in more to these uh, small planktivorous fish, the bulk of the studies are coming from Eastern Australia around the Great Barrier Reef. 90% of the data points in this group that I have are from this region. And furthermore, half of those are some species of clownfish. So this is an area where I think the oceanification and research community could maybe think about capacity development, for example. There's a whole lot of reef fish around the Indo-Pacific that haven't yet been studied, um, but this is an area where we could 
potentially focus to provide more nuanced information about coral reef ecosystems in our future oceans. So after showing you what I gathered in the database, I'd like to turn to discussing now how we actually implemented all the data from these studies into sensitivity parameters. Because remember, the goal of this work was to use all these studies to better inform Atlantis. So for each of the responses, I calculated effect sizes, whether that's the odds ratio or hedges G, depending on the type of data. And then for pH, I fit random effects models by REML and used AIC values to select either an intercept only, a linear or a quadratic relationship with decreases in pH. Um, for temperature, we fit intercept only models, which you'll see uh, why later in just a minute. <clears throat> And so after we uh, developed these parameters and model responses, the next step was implementing into Atlantis. And so that's what I'll finish up with in just a couple of slides. So this is an example of what one of our relationships look like. Uh, this is for the branching parietes. Here along the x-axis, pH values have been converted into hydrogen ion concentration, and that's because pH is on a log scale. So converting uh, this hydrogen ion concentration change back into change in pH isn't so straightforward. Um, it depends on the initial pH, some other factors. Um, but essentially, the, P, the change of zero right here is around a pH of eight, and then around where the studies uh, cut off is around a pH of seven. And on the y-axis, uh, we have effect size in this case, which is the odds ratio. So for this group, uh, we saw an overall slight decline in pH. And so this is a relationship that we can use to inform Atlantis. So Mariska is now in the process of implementing the model fits um, from 29 functional groups for which we found data into Atlantis. And in Atlantis, the estimated scalar gets multiplied with the rate parameters and needs to be between one, which is no effect, and zero, which is no more growth in the biomass of the functional group. So we took a similar approach to Bush and McElhaney and standardized all slopes to the slope of the most sensitive species, which in this case is the five Ls. So let's set uh, one at the current pH of around eight and zero at a pH of seven and then scaled all slopes to the, to the bivalve slope. So here on the screen is that same uh, group of branching parietes from the last slide. And although the x-axis is flipped around, you can probably tell that there's still a similar um, sort of relationship to scale to fit within what Atlantis can use. For temperature, approach is a little bit different. Um, Atlantis is used to using Q10 values, which are normally around a value of two. And so this means that for every increase in 10 degrees Celsius, the rate of anything like growth um, doubles. So Mariska used our, our values um, by adding two to them and then scaling them plus or minus around two. to so again, sort of uh, work it into a form that Atlantis uh, can recognize and um, successfully use. So Mariska is currently tuning that model and doing preliminary runs. So here's an example of what some of those look like at this point. Uh, the greenish blue lines are the model without any changes in pH, the present day conditions. But then the pink line that you see as well are those uh, with changes in uh, pH implemented through time. And that's using the sensitivity that we've provided from these databases, from fitting uh, the models to the data uh, in order to inform how the, the biomass of these functional groups changes over time. So in summary, I have a few key takeaways to share. Um, one is that from examining the database of literature that I compiled, there's a clear focus on some functional groups rather than others. Uh, for example, we didn't have very many um, mesophotic fish, but there is a high level of interest in those small planktivorous uh, fish, the damselfish and the, the crownfish. So studying um, one group of organisms very closely is very helpful for teasing out some of these, our understanding of the, the physiology or the mechanisms that's underlying any sensitivity or tolerance, um, but at least bigger gaps in our functional groups uh, and sort of hinders how well we can see what an ecosystem like a coral reef might look like in the future. But one of the neat ways of using um, this meta analytic approach, approach we have is that if suddenly there's a new spark of interest in one of these different groups, uh, we can go back through and just pull out the literature uh, specifically targeted on that group, run it through the same sort of uh, quantitative analyses we've done here, and then implement it into Atlantis to either further refine the model. And so what I've showed through this talk is that uh, this is just one approach we can use to incorporate uh, quantitative data from experiments to inform Atlantis, but there are also still some remaining challenges to that. 
Uh, for example, we were able to incorporate the hydrogen ion concentration into Atlantis uh, models, but there's still not such a clear alignment on the sorts of the data that are coming up from experiments or out of these meta-analyses that translates to what Atlantis needs to run. So as you saw, we had to adjust some of the, the parameters that I discussed earlier uh, into a form that Atlantis can use. And so going forward, perhaps this is an area where we can think about how to improve functionality to better translate uh, experimental data into uh, something that can be used to support ecosystem-based management. So finally, I'd like to thank a suite of people who helped me with this project. Uh, the first one is Zach, who um, helped pull hundreds of PDF files and scan them for relevant literature. Caitlin also helped pull some data uh, to build our database. Christy Croker provided um, the, her databases from her renowned 2011-2013 meta-analyses that we used as a starting place. Beth Fulton works on the Atlantis model and helped uh, make some of those changes in the code that we needed to implement our parameters. And then Tom was incredibly helpful with some key pieces of code in the analysis. And I'd like to also thank the NOAA OSHA's vacation program for funding uh, this part of the project. Um, I had a really wonderful learning experience working on it. And thank you to all of you who are listening right now for that support. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. You can also find my email address if you'd like to email me later or I'm on Twitter as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Caitlin. We do have a couple questions to kick off. Uh, first thing, how did you go about extracting data from papers? Was there a certain program that you made or used? Oh, so that's a really good question. Um, it starts off by developing uh, a database with um, basically all the information that you want to pull. So that would be everything from, you know, the species, the functional group that it's in, uh, the latitude and the longitude they were collected from, uh, and any other responses, study duration, um, whether external treatments are fluctuating, for example. So really getting that, that database together. And then it's just a matter of going through, through the literature. So pulling up a PDF, uh, scanning it for all these key sorts of information and just manually entering that in. So it's a, it's a very time consuming process to get uh, all the metadata and the data for each of these, these papers. Um, and I believe I mentioned there are certain tools like Data Thief or um, Webplot Digitizer where you can take a screenshot of a figure from a paper and uh, scale the axes as you need to and then actually pull the data. So not only like the mean or the average of the data, but also some of the, the confidence intervals around it or the the standard deviations and so that's how we end up calculating the effect size down the line along with the using sample size and those sorts of response values. Great, thank you. Our next question was uh, what about studies on tropical estuarine biota? Oh that's a really good question. That was not something that we included in our search um, mainly because it isn't a large part of the the Hawaiian Atlantis ecosystem model. Uh, it's definitely something you could look at in other areas, though. Um, there were SUR studies that came up in my, my search terms. Uh, and so that would be something that someone else could look at. I actually haven't seen any uh, sort of information about that in terms of meta-analyses in the literature yet. So it'd be a neat project to pursue. Great, thank you. I'm not seeing any more questions. So if you are listening in and you have a question, please place that either in the question panel, or if you can't uh, use the question panel, you can always email the library at library.brownbag at noaa.gov and we can ask questions from there as well. So we did have a question come in. Did you find any temperature resources that were drastically different from the standard Q10 values used? Wow, oh, so that's a, that's a good point. Um, so Q10 is not something that's commonly measured in a lot of the, the ocean forming studies or any of the temperature studies that we looked at. So um, that's a place where we had to take all the different temperature responses and sort of convert them to a sort of Q10 like value. So for example, for temperature, we were pulling responses from survival. So did organisms live or die essentially in these, uh, these warmer ocean conditions? How much did they grow? Um, did they assimilate uh, lipid reserves or, um, or other nutritional qualities? Were they able to recognize predators and escape uh, just as quickly? Um, all that sort of information goes into the responses for pH and temp temperature. We did largely just focus on that growth and survival. 
but uh, we we did have a broad set of responses that we used um, to calculate the the model parameters and then converted that to this sort of Q10 like value that is typically used in Atlantis. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question. Do you have a specific recommendation of how papers should present data to make it easy to ingest in your meta-analysis? Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> um, some of the key points are labeling, whether you have standard deviation and standard error or 95% confidence intervals. Uh, that's very helpful. I had email uh, more than a few authors for that sort of, sort of information. Um, reporting sample sizes is incredibly important. Um, somewhere, you know, clearly in the text, but ideally on a figure, um, and particularly sample sizes for each group. Uh, a range um, can be somewhat helpful, but not when you need to ascribe a particular number to the response that you're seeing. So just thinking about, uh, you know, what, what sort of quantitative values go in, into your statistics and making sure that those are easy to find either on a figure or somewhere clearly labeled in the text. That was a big challenge that um, can slow down data pulling is trying to find that information or having to email authors for that sort of that sort of detail. Awesome, thank you. Our next question. Did your study include only lab experiments or also field observations along natural or temporal gradients? Oh, that's a really excellent question. So that was the decision um, we we had to make when we were um, sorting out our literature. So for this, we largely focused on laboratory experiments, except in the, the case where uh, an animal was exposed out in the lab and then perhaps like released into the environment to study their ability to avoid predators on uh, like a head of coral um, later on. We did not end up uh, using uh, field experiments along a natural gradient, and that's largely because, um, you know, there's other uh, variables that can come into play here that may influence the response, and so um, that's not uh, something that's sort of easy to tease out. If, for example, they did have organisms on a, on a vent or organisms in a, a more sort of normal pH environment and switch those, those are experiments that we were able to, to use in our meta-analysis. Great, thank you. Do you have a couple more questions? Mm -hmm. How did you cut the articles from 64,000 down to 8,700? Was it additional Boolean statements? Uh, did you have to download all those papers or did you use something like Abstractor? Mm -hmm. So it was a tool Abstractor, which, um, so that's reviewing the abstracts of just the papers. Uh, it's that sort of preliminary view to say, based on what's in this abstract, does it look like it may be relevant? Like, or maybe it's it's very relevant and that's clear. So you'd give it a yes or a maybe. But there's maybe terms like it said it was in the Baltic Sea and that's well outside of my geographic zone. So like I could easily cut that down. So you was using Abstractor to get to those 8,700 papers, um, abstracts. And then from there it was scanning <laughs> um, like thousands of papers essentially to, to get down to the number that we actually uh, pulled data from. Yeah. So Zach was a very big help in actually getting the full text of those papers that we could examine and then make the final determination of whether it was relevant within our, our search terms or not. Great, thank you. Uh, last question. If there was one species in Hawaii that should be worked on to assess sensitivity to high CO2 conditions, what would it be? Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's a really excellent question. I think I would say it's those key fish that you see on the coral reefs but aren't well reflected. So something like the trigger fish or the, the surgeon fish or the butterfly fish. I had the opportunity to go diving um, on my weekends in Hawaii, which is beautiful. And those are the fish that you see out. You see them uh, performing their functions within the ecosystem. And obviously they're a very key part. And that's not something that has really been brought back into the lab and studied. So not even just studying their growth and survival, but also perhaps studying how um, they're still, what their grazing rates are or uh, you know, how they're avoiding uh, predators on the reef and still performing their, their vital functions. That's what I would say, so those, those key fish. Great, thank you so much, Caitlin. We're gonna take about a minute here to switch over to our next presenter for the second half of our Knauss Fellows presentation today. Thank you, everyone.